Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of March 4th, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we walk through a spreadsheet that explains why Governor Mike Dunleavy is doing what he's doing on the Alaska budget. Second, we discuss why we believe a flat tax is better than PFD cuts and other options. And third, before we go too far down the road of making changes, let's reflect on what SB 21, the oil tax change from 2013, has accomplished. And now, let's join Michael. And welcome back to the uh, largest radio show in the state of Alaska, broadcasting statewide from on Alaska all the way up into the interior. It is the Michael Duke Show, Common Sense Radio. It's what we try and do anyway. I mean, we, I don't know if we always succeed, but today usually is, uh, is right there on target uh, because we bring in a guy who knows these numbers inside and out. It is Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets is his organization, uh, and they're dedicated to just that, bringing the Alaska budget back into something that, you know, is recognizable as, uh, you know, approaching sustainability. Uh, and he comes in every week to give us his weekly top three. And we're going to start off today. And, and for those of you, first of all, um, who are going to be listening along on the radio at home, uh, we're going to go over some numbers and discuss some things today, including a, a big spreadsheet, which is going to be Brad's number one. And you'll be able to find that spreadsheet uh, online uh, on the uh, on the Facebook page. So if you want to follow along at home, grab your phone and go over to facebook.com slash Michael Duke Show, and I'll be putting pictures of what we're talking about up on the screen, and you can always go back on the podcast, and you can listen or watch the video later as well with kind of full graphics of and, you know, uh, aids of what we're watching because we're going to get down into it. Brad Keithley, good morning, sir. How are you? Michael, I'm doing great today. How are you? Oh, man, I'm trying to enhance my calm. Uh, so we're going to uh, – let's let's talk a little bit. You've got big th- three big things – and you have taken the time, of course, to break all this out and talk about, you know, the impact of the budget, what the governor was trying to do. Let's talk about the three things that you think uh, are the most important. And you start things off, I mean, before everybody's eyes glaze over and they start snoozing, with a giant spreadsheet which kind of lays everything out in, at a glance. Tell us a little bit about it. Well, the the I, I, I've been trying – I've been struggling with how to explain this to Alaskans – how, how to explain these issues to Alaskans in a currency that is that is familiar to them and and how they understand and, and how they can appreciate it and and I finally have have glommed on to talking about it in terms of how much is going to be taken how much would be taken out of your PFD check uh, in order to maintain funding uh, for for various categories of spending and so this this spreadsheet, uh, which I sometimes refer to as the mother of all spreadsheets, is a way to is, is a way to calculate how much is being taken out of your out of your PFD check to fund various categories of spending, and then depending upon your income bracket, what that means is a percent of your income. In essence, how much are you being taxed uh, out of your income to pay for these various categories of spending? So just to pick the largest one first, health and social services. And, and this starts with a $3,000 PFD check. So assume the government is about to give you a $3,000 PFD check, which is what Governor Dunleavy wants to do. Out of that three, out of that $3,000 PFD check, in order to fund, restore funding to health and and, and social ser- and human services back to what 
the, the level that Governor Walker proposed before Governor Dunleavy cut it to restore that funding back as many in these in these town halls asked the legislature to do, asked legislators to do, out of your $3,000 PFD check, the government would take back $576. That's just to restore funding to health and social services, $576. <laughs> So now you're down to now you're down to less than twenty five hundred dollars. You're down to about twenty four hundred dollars in change. And all we've done is restore funding to health and social services. Now K through twelve. In order to fund, in order to restore funding to K through twelve, as again all of these people in the town hall, had a lot of these people in the town halls have asked legislators to do, the government's going to take five hundred and thirteen dollars out of your out of your check. We've already taken 576. Now we're going to take $513 to restore K through 12 funding. Right. So now you're down to less than $2,000 uh, uh, of of your PFD that, that's remaining because government's taken back over $1,000, about $1,080 to 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 restore funding to health and social services and to K through 12. Now we come to the university. The university wants their funding restored, and if you went to the, if you saw the town halls in Fairbanks, there was a large contingent of university people that turned out asking to restore funding to the university. So now we're going to take, if we're going to restore funding to the university, now we're going to take out another two hundred and forty-six dollars out of your, out of your, out of your check. So now you're down to somewhere in the neighborhood of fifteen hundred dollars. You started out with three thousand. And we funded. We've all we've done is taken out the funding necessary to fund three of these these government entities, and you're down to about fifteen hundred dollars. This keeps going on and on and on and on, and at the end of it, if we if we restored as as some people as some people want us to do, if we restored funding from the levels back to the levels, out of your thousand dollars, I'm going to take the government's going to take twenty six hundred dollars back. <laughs> In, in order to in order to restore spending uh, to to all these various categories, you at the end of the day you get four hundred dollars of your three thousand in order to restore and and government six hundred taxes you the twenty six hundred in order to restore spending to all of these various categories. That's what's going on. So when somebody talks about oh we need to restore health and social services, we need to restore that spending, that's five hundred and seventy-six dollars to your PFD. That, that they're talking about taking five hundred and seventy-six dollars out of your PFD check. If you're in a family of four, they're talking about taking nearly twenty-four hundred dollars. Yep. Out of your out of your family's out of your family's account to to somebody in the lower and and then and then you sort of start going through. Well, what does that mean? What does that mean to people in various income brackets? Twenty-four hundred dollars. Uh, family of four, uh, if you're in the lowest 20% of, of income, that's a tax of 12% just to pay for health and social services. Right. If you're in the middle uh, middle income, that's a tax of nearly 4% just on your income, 4% income tax just to pay for health and social services. But if you're in the top 20%, and this is why Natasha – this is why it's so frustrating. Why Natasha doesn't get what's going on? I don't think it only takes less than one percent, point nine percent, out of her income. Well, actually, it's even less for her since she earns more than the average. But only only point nine percent out of the average top twenty percent person's income to fund health and social services. So of course they're fine with doing it because it's less than one percent. It's less than they give to United Way. Right. But by doing it through PFD cuts, they're they're impacting middle uh, middle family middle income families by four percent and the lowest twenty percent by twelve percent. That's the tax rate they're imposing on them just for health and social services. Somebody says, "Oh, we need to restore funding to the university." Oh my gosh, the university's got to have all that funding back. And actually, they need more. People would argue, but we've at least got to restore what Governor Dunleavy did. That's two hundred forty-six dollars out of your three thousand. They want you to pay $246 to fund the university. Family of four, that's about $1,000. What does that mean to the lowest 20%? That's an, in, that's an income tax of 5% on 
I'm the lowest 20 percent just to pay for the university. And I, I know, I'm, spo- I'm yeah, supposed to stay calm. Right, right. And you're supposed to stay calm. I know. Well, and it's hard because, I mean, you know, we're breaking this down. Brad Keithley, by the way, is our guest from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. But, I mean, you, this is brilliant because you've broken it out department by department and, and program by program. But let's break it down to the bottom line, Brad. When you get down to the bottom total agency spend and the, the huge disparity for me here is looking at this and looking at it by income bracket and realizing that the lowest 20% of Alaskans are paying a 30, nearly 31% tax on their income for current government services. 31%. That's insane. Yeah, that's just the operating budget. That's 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 not counting. That's not counting the capital budget. And all of the other things that get factored in here. By the time you do that, it's more than fifty percent. By the it, by by the time you get down to the bottom line, and they're taking twenty six hundred dollars out of your three thousand to fund government to restore government funding back to where Gover- Governor Walker proposed it. That's a fifth more than a fifty percent tax on a family of four in the lowest twenty percent. It's more. It's almost an eighteen percent tax on a middle income family. On a family in the in the middle twenty percent uh, of 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 the of the income specter, it's less than a five percent tax on the top on the top twenty percent. Again, about what they might give to United Way. So you, you, the the imp, the disparate impacts that we're having across the income brackets by using a PFD by using PFD cuts and the size of the PFD cuts. That that, they're, that people are talking about to restore spending is just is just amazing. This this helps, I think, me, and and hopefully others understand what Governor Dunleavy's up to. I mean, he's saying, look, to fund government, I've got to take. We would have to take twenty six hundred dollars back out of your three thousand dollar PFD check in order to uh, in order to to, to maintain government spending at the levels that Governor Walker proposed it. That's not right. Alaskans shouldn't be taxed that much for government. And so I'm going to cut it back, cut government back to a level that that that, and that allows Alaskans to keep their $3,000 uh, uh, PFD. And that and those are those are huge cuts. But looking at it another way, you're asking Alaskans to, to pay a PFD tax of nearly 90% of their PFD to keep government going the way it was going. Right. And, so he's trying to, he's trying to reset the playing field. He doesn't want people to pay $513 toward K through 12. He doesn't out of their $3,000 PFD check. He doesn't want them to pay $576 out of their PF out of their $3,000 PFG D check to, to, to fund health and social services. This is a tool, Brad, that is just so amazing. I mean, I, I hope that people will go out. Now, again, I've got the link up in the chat room, and I'll actually uh, I'll put it up in the, in, the, in the header of the video so you don't have to search through all the comments in the video to find it. But, I mean, you, if you could print this out, bring it in, show it to your elected representatives when you're backing up, when you're talking about, because all I hear is about, well, why, is, why the governor? What? Give me a justification for why you're doing this. Because we are out of money. I mean, I, you may need a deeper justification as to why you want to do things, but I think that pretty much the answer that is the right answer, not the wrong answer, is there is no more water in the well. What do you want from us? Yep, exactly right. And that's the answer, you know, that's the answer that the OMB director has essentially been giving to, to the legislators. There is no more money out there. You're going to have to go take it from Alaskans and take it through cutting their PFD. And Alaskans, if they voted for one thing when they voted for Dunleavy, it was that they didn't want their PFD cut. Yep. Absolutely. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budget. Now, Harold is in the chat room, of course, our, our favorite friend here, Harold. He says, I 100% disagree with the idea of the flat tax. That column should read oil tax correction instead, um, which uh, I don't know is that there's not, you know, although I agree with Harold in part, and I think Brad and I are, you know, I'm halfway between Brad and Harold on this. Uh, there's not enough money left on the table, I don't think, to fill that flat tax gap. 
Uh, we are going to talk about that uh, as number three. We're going to hit that at the end, and I'm sure Harold will get all his questions in, and Brad will hopefully be able to answer that when we talk about SB uh, 21 and, and some of the ramifications of what is available, what is left on the table in Brad's estimation. Um, but, Brad, this whole thing is – we were talking about this just before we came on the air – the the disconnect and maybe it's an income thing i mean when you've got the vast majority of legislators are in the top 20 percent income earners it's that disconnect um uh, but you would think that the reaction from the election itself would be a kind of a wake-up call for some of these folks you would but but you've got a huge amount of pushback by in in these town hall meetings by people who are saying oh you've got to fund this or you've got to fund that um, and legislators are responding to that. They're also responding to, you know, they're listening from their donors who are saying, hey, PFD cuts, I mean, in, in Natasha's case, PFD cuts aren't that big a deal, right? They don't take that much of my income. And, um, and, and yeah, we, you know, we probably should have K through 12. We probably should have a nice university and all that sort of stuff. So um, uh, we, can, we can afford all that. It's not, it's not that big a hit to me. So I, I, I think there's just a... a, 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 a a fairly narrow box that people are operating in um, and thinking about it in their own personal situation or thinking about it in the situation that their donors are in and saying, yeah, PFD cuts are good, but, but you just, they're not seeing the impact on middle uh, and lower income Alaska families from this. Michael, while we're in the break, I want to point out one number that, that came out of this uh, analysis that really that surprised even me. Uh, and it's the impact of SB 57 which is the governor's proposal to move uh, the, the, the property tax on pipelines from, on, on taps from the boroughs um, into state government and, and make, that, make that revenue state government revenue as opposed to borough revenue. I, didn't, I hadn't really focused on how big the impact of that was, but that is of your $3,000 PF, $3, PFD, that's $664. If we don't make that move, if we don't move the revenues from the borough, from those three boroughs up uh, in, into the state, then that just blows a hole in the Dunleavy budget. That The lack of that revenue will blow a, a hole in the Dunleavy budget that in order to close through PFD cuts is $664. That's a, that, that issue is a, is a much bigger issue uh, than I gave it credit for when, uh, when the governor first came out with his budget um, and represents a major issue uh, in terms of in terms of how we're going to uh, uh, deal with uh, the fiscal situation going forward, if put it put another way, if if SB 57 doesn't pass, if the if the money doesn't come isn't changed from the boroughs to come into the state, then that's another 400 million dollars that the, that either the governor has to cut uh, out of elsewhere out of spending. Uh, or has to make up for through uh, through new revenues, um, and and some legislators will propose doing that through the PFD cuts, and that's a six hundred sixty four dollar PFD cut. Yeah, uh, to make to make up that hole. So seven hundred bucks out of everybody's check, essentially, just to make up that one hole in and of itself. I mean, and, and there's been a lot of comp there's been a lot of complaints about well, this is just a cost shift. This is just a but let's face it. Government that is closest to the people is the most responsive to the people. And what we have is we have municipalities and communities who for years have been living in part on the largesse of the state providing these monies for these programs that if you really don't want to pay for them, maybe you shouldn't have them. Yeah, exactly right. I mean... That's as I mean I I'm just I'm this is this is about as close as you can get to do you really want to pay for it is it something that's essential or has it just been nice to have because the state has footed the bill Yeah Anchorage I mean just you sort of look around the boroughs Anchorage has has survived without having any uh, of of the pipeline property tax it's been focused on three boroughs the the North Slope borough the Fairbanks borough uh, and the Valdez borough and and yes they've had I mean They've they've been able to cushion uh, the cost of their programs by essentially you know taking that revenue in at the borough level and and avoiding uh, avoiding having to confront how, whether to cut programs or, uh, or or increase the cost on on, on local users. Yeah, I, quickly. There, there's 
there's a big debate to have about that issue, but it's a big issue. It's a much bigger issue than I gave it credit for. Brad, we now have to move on to number two, which was yesterday. I had a very, very uncomfortable discussion with the listeners about taxes. Taxes are coming. Now, they could be the form of a continuation to a cut to the PFD, which is the most regressive and most detrimental to the economy, or we can help drive that conversation. But I think inevitably taxes are going to befall us one way or the other. They may not call it a tax, but they are coming, and we need to grab this bull by the horns. No matter how upset or uncomfortable or angry it makes us, we've got to do it. And the fat and the flat tax has is is the best option hands down. I I I I I think that's right, Michael. And and you and this spreadsheet actually helps you understand uh, in part why that is. PFD taxes. I mean, there's four major options out there: PFD taxes, sales taxes, progressive income taxes, or a flat tax. And and of those of those four options, three of them tilt uh, the the obligation uh, uh, makes make Alaskans pay more as a percent of their income uh, feel. Uh, uh, a greater burden uh, than other Alaskans. And the three are the PFD tax. You can see that on the chart. Uh, uh, We were talking about uh, the impact of the agency spending uh, recovered through a PFD tax. It's 2.34% on the income of a top 20% family of four, but it's 30.81% of a tax, a PFD tax is 30.81 on a family of four in the the lowest 21%. Obviously, it's, it's affecting uh, lower, middle, and lower income Alaskans are having to pay a lot more than upper income Alaskans as a percent uh, through a PFD tax. The same thing occurs to a lesser extent with a sales tax. Sales taxes also are regressive. The the top 20% pay more or pay less um, uh, as a percent of income through a sales tax than the, the middle and lower uh, income Alaskans. And frankly, I think we're beginning to see the beginning of, of the top 20%'s plan B uh, over the weekend in one of the uh, one of the town halls, Representative Chuck Kopp uh, from South Anchorage, who is a representative in the same Senate district as Senator Von Imhoff, uh, said he could he could support he could see himself supporting possibly a statewide sales tax um, uh, in order to fund government. Right. And 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 that's just I mean. It's sort of it's sort of the top 20 percent's plan B because it also tilts heavily to um, uh, low middle and low income Alaskans have have them pay more as a percent of their income. The progressive income tax is the reverse of that. Uh, using national statistics, uh, roughly 40 percent, the top 40 percent pay most of the tax. The bottom 60 percent pay a very small percent of the tax. So you're just reversing the the tilt. Uh, that occurs under under either a flat tax or a sales tax. You're just burdening the upper income uh, classes more than than lower income uh, uh, classes, and and having them pay for uh, the bulk of government. And really, what what happened with the problem with the with the progressive income tax is the is the the, the other 60%, the the ones that aren't paying a big part of the tax. Uh, frankly, have no consequences of asking for more government, right? Uh, because they don't have to pay for it, right? Just, just like when the top twenty percent asks for more government. Well, to me, to me, the fairest approach is a flat tax that has all Alaska families and non-residents earning income in Alaska, like slope workers and and fish workers and others that earn income off Alaska from Alaska, but don't uh, don't pay a tax now. It has them paying the same percent across the board. There are no free riders. Nobody is paying less than any other. Nobody's paying more than any other. And to me, one of the additional benefits of that is because everybody has the same skin in the game, everybody has the same incentive to keep uh, uh, spending down. I mean, we all feel if we all paid a a 5% uh, flat tax or four percent flat tax or a three percent flat tax. We would all be after our legislators, uh, to the top twenty percent included, to get spending down uh, to limit the amount of tax we have to pay. With a PFD tax, the top twenty percent has no incentive to do that. With a progressive income tax, the the, the lower forty percent, sixty percent, have no incentive to do that. 
and that's frankly one of the ways we've we've gotten into we've gotten into this problem. We've always played with other people's money, either the oil company's money or the right. savings that we've built up over the years. Or we get or we get tied up in this kind of classism. Um, I saw I was watching a video of the uh, of the Homer Town Hall with Sarah Vance uh, uh, this yesterday, and uh, one of the cries from the crowd was, "We think those with a lot of money should have to kick in a little more." And they're like, wait a second, why shouldn't we all just, you know, pay a little bit? I mean, shouldn't that make more sense? Uh, you know, you get the sales tax that everybody talked about, but that doesn't do anything to capture the money for the folks who commute in to work on the slope or in the ferry system or whatever that live somewhere else. I mean, there's lots of holes in there. If we just had that flat tax on income, everybody would have the same, essentially the same numerically, the same skin in the game. Yep, yeah, exactly right. And everybody would have the same incentive to... It, the town hall with Sarah would have been, well, how can we hold spending down as opposed to, hey, let's get somebody else to pay for it so we can keep can we, so we can keep spending going up. Right. I mean, that's part of what that's part of what you saw in the in the Anchorage town hall. She saw people from the from the top 20 and the and the upper middle incomes, teachers, others uh, come in there and say, hey, we need additional spending knowing through P- it, we and we can live with lower PFDs knowing that that the impact of the PFD tax on them was going to be relatively minor, so it's sort of a free shot to argue for additional spending. Right. It would have been a, it would have been a different game had everybody come into those town halls and 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 known that they were going to have to pay four percent uh, of their income for any uh, for any additional spending they were arguing about. And that's that I think is is the biggest benefit of a flat tax. Not only is it fair across the board to all Alaskans, not only does it get non include non-resident income, but it gives all Alaskans the same skin in the game to finding that balance between what it is we want, which is the spending side, and what it is we're willing to pay, which is the revenue side. Well, and if we're not willing to have this discussion, I mean, I know a lot of people yesterday in the chat room were just furious that I would even talk about this, uh, that we must cut before we do anything. If we're not willing to have the conversation or at least try and steer it, we're going to get run over because they're going to do it one way or the other. They will do it either through that stealth tax because that can't escape the governor's. I mean, that, that the veto pen can't fix the, uh, the dividend tax. Um, or we're going to face some other form of tax one way or the other. If we don't at least steer this conversation, we're going to get killed on this. Yeah, exactly right. And, and, it's, and, it's, and if anybody really doubts that, they need to go read The Frontiersman uh, uh, today. Uh, there's an article in there written by Tim Bradner uh, reporting on a speech given by Senator Von Imhoff um, at, uh, at Commonwealth North last week. And that article is very clear that legislators have, and, and, and this is the co-chair of Senate Finance, so it's not just some the mill legislator on the top of their head. This is one of the leadership um, uh, saying that we're going to restore a bunch of spending uh, and, and just sort of period, end of statement, on to the next thing. And if anybody, if anybody believes that, that we're going to get out of this legislature with, with Governor Dunleavy's P, uh, cuts in, hand, uh, cuts in, in, in place, uh, they're just not under, they're not t- keeping track of what's going on down there. So it, 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 it we're, we are going to have, it, we are going to have increased spending. We are going to have some sort of revenue to pay for that. Um, and, and the, the default that, that Senator Von Imhoff's trying to push as, as the senator from the top 20 percent, the default she's trying to push is PFD taxes because right. she, does, she doesn't pay much of it. All right, we're down to two minutes, Brad. Uh, your number three is talking about SB 21. I've said that there's money left on the table. Lots of folks in the chat room have said the answer here is to tax the oil companies into fixing this. Uh, you got 90 seconds to give me a synopsis here on the – I know that's hard, but let's let's give it an attempt here. Well, I, I think there's one chart that people need to look at uh, before, as we get into this discussion, and that's a chart I put up about a week ago. I'll put it back up on the page uh, after we get off here, and that's a chart that looks at projections of ANS production, ANS oil production, for SB21 uh, and after SB21. Before SB21, we were projected to be at 300, and and these were these were state projections. These aren't you know, biased one way or the other. There's state projections of where we were headed. Before SB21, we were projected to be at 339,000 barrels a day of oil by 2022. Uh, it, the downward slope was was significant. 
Um, and and that's you know, that's where we we're supposed to be at 339,000 barrels a day. With SB 21, uh, the projection now is 493 493,000 barrels, 160,000 barrels, almost 50% more than where we were projected to be uh, in 2022 uh, before SB 21. So before, as we get into this discussion about oil taxes, we need to look at what SB 21 has done for us. That, that increase of 160,000 barrels a day, when you look at the projection for 2022, is huge. I mean, you, we're, we're in enough trouble now. Think where we would be if oil production was 339,000 barrels uh, in, if we were looking at 339,000 barrels in fiscal year 2022 yep. instead of 493,000 barrels. Yep, absolutely. So as all the hatred flows deeply here in the chat room, let's uh, let's get, let's get into it uh, because we all know that the oil companies are raping us uh, repeatedly here um, and, uh, and and doing everything they can to stick it to us. Now, I'm not saying that as a business they're not trying to get as much as they possibly can. Um, but, uh, I mean, there is still some money on the table. Now I've thrown some numbers around. You've said there are, there is some money on the table. Give me an estimate, Brad, of how much you think would still be available if we tweaked, not removed, but tweaked SB 21 to make it as fair and equitable for the citizens of the state, the owner citizens of the state, uh, versus what the oil companies are saying. Give us your estimate of how much you think is still laying on the table that we could utilize, uh, towards paying for state government. Well, Michael, it's really you have to do a competitive analysis to do that. You have to say, you have to look at at how Alaska's uh, structure sets up against against the global structure, and and what changes we could make. I can I can identify one change that I think would be appropriate to reflect the fact that the that the federal corporate rate uh, came down has come down significantly since the time that we passed uh, SB 21, companies are getting more money uh, as a result of, of lower federal taxes, and that's not really being shared fully back with the state. That may be $200 million. Um, to, to, to talk about more than that, uh, I think there really needs to be a full competitive analysis of, of what the company's alternatives are. The reason that we were on the decline curve, that we were on uh, before SB 21, the reason we were going down to 329,000, projected to go down to 339,000 barrels a day by 2022, 2022, is because we weren't getting our historic share of investment, investment that otherwise we needed to continue to develop Alaska's resources was going someplace else, and we were just on a decline. We were just essentially harvesting out uh, the investments that we had made uh, in the past. The reason we're now at 493,000, a projection of 493,000 barrels uh, for 2022, is because that we have we have developed, we've attracted a significant amount of additional investment that's put us on a much different production curve than we were on before uh, SB 21. Before before we go just willy nilly making uh, uh, changes in the oil taxes in order to get more out of the out of the, you know, treat the oil companies as an ATM and, and go cash in more, take more of what we think is in our account out of the oil companies. Before we do that, we need to make uh, a competitive assessment. If we don't do that, we just go crashing through it. We very well could put ourselves back on the production curve that sends us down to 330, the equivalent of 339,000 barrels in 2024, 2025, or 2026. And think again what that does to us. We're in we're in we're in tough enough shape now, with oil production around 500,000 barrels a day. If we go crashing down to 350,000 barrels, we're going to be in even tougher shape uh, than we were before. <clears throat> so probably you know maybe around 200 million from the from the change in from 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 a changes that reflect the change in the, in the federal corporate tax rate. But before we go crashing around making and, and, and thinking that there's much more out there on the table, we've got to do a competitive analysis to make sure that we're not cutting off our nose to spite our face. One of the interesting, what I would think would be interesting right now, because again, one of uh, one of our great listeners, Harold, is is in the chat room, and he's he's you know he's good with the numbers, and he's you know, and we are we're talking about uh, this stuff. He is you know almost diametrically opposed to what you're talking about. What I'd love to hear is a sit down. 
uh, between you know you and Harold to discuss the merits of this because I think it would be an interesting conversation uh, to have from your perspective. Uh, I mean, you know the 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 of course the intimation is since you're previously an oil company guy that you're always an oil company guy. I haven't found that to be the case, but uh, you know that's the uh, that's the intimation here and. I, I would think that maybe sometime here, if you'd be willing, I would love to sit down and just kind of do this, you know, kind of roundtable discussion with the three of us to discuss this in detail in like a podcast form. Uh, if uh, it, that that would make for interesting uh, discussions, I would think if you would if you would be up for that, I would love oh, to. Oh sure, see. but but we've got but we, we need certain certain ground rules on that. I mean, we've the, the all companies are not an ATM. I mean, Willikowski and others talk about it like they're an ATM, like right. they're getting all these earnings, and we can joke just go withdraw from them. Well, you you have to understand the, just like just like people have to understand the consequences of pulling from the PFD, pulling money from the PFD into government. What does that do to people who are otherwise getting the PFD? What does that do to their economics? What does that do to what they do in their lives? And what does that do to the overall Alaska economy? You have to understand the same thing from 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 the oil company standpoint. You can you can't treat it if you treat them like an ATM and just go pull a bunch of money out of it, they've got they've got choices. They can go take new investment other locations. And, and that's what this decline curve shows. It shows what's happened when we, when we, when we set up a tax regime that was competitive uh, uh, internationally for investment. It shows the benefit that we got out of that. So, right. well, and it, I'm also to, but, have this, to have this discussion, we need to have a discussion about the competitive effects as well as, hey, we want more money and they've got money. And, and, and I, I understand that concept and I agree with it in a point, but I also understand that these oil companies know they've got they're playing the long game. They know that they can starve out certain sectors, that they can stop investments and show, hey, if we do that, you know, they, they're, they're there to play the long game as well. They're willing to slow investment down for a few years if in the long run they get a better deal. And so there's a little bit of that going on as well. Um, you know, I mean, I, I think that there's, like I said, somewhere in the middle here, middle ground is the true answer. And I would really love to to hash this out sometime. And uh, maybe we could do that uh, sometime in the uh, in the future here. Um, sure. But uh, anyway, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. As always, it's a pleasure to talk with you. It's always thought provoking. We appreciate you coming on board and sharing with us, Brad. Thank you. Michael, as always, thanks for having well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3. <laughs>